of the Lord. And I'm going to read to you from Colossians, the letter to the Colossians in chapter 1, versicle 15. And it says, The supremacy of Christ. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. <clears throat> for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. The word of the Lord. <clears throat> so I will begin by uh, reflecting on the introduction to the retreat. We are here this afternoon to reflect on our faith and to say uh, that we are to reflect on our faith means to prepare our hearts, to lay down all the weapons of our misery or pride and pretentiousness and vanity that we are built in naturally because of the law in us that tends us to sin and to uh, rebel against, against what leads us to God, something unavoidable, something that is in us. So when we come to speak about God and to reflect upon God and our faith, there is a struggle and a battle. Maybe we are not aware of it, but it's taking place because the first uh, obstacle is the instrument. If I am here to speak, then I, I could be an obstacle. And if you are here to listen, your listening could be an obstacle too. So we are going to ask the Lord to grant us the grace of being able to be free, to be able to love unconditionally so that we can open to the Holy Spirit our hearts and the Holy Spirit could flow through us, uh, allowing us to uh, be able to receive what the Lord has in store for us today so that nothing will stop the Lord from doing it. And that's what we pray the Lord to, to, to give us this afternoon. I'm sure that if each one of us were to uh, stand up and give uh, a testimony as to where we are at in relationship to our faith, we will have a great treasure for all of us to discover because each one of us is unique and no one like us. We all have a different approach to the faith. God manifests himself through us in a, a unique way. And that's why we are the living stones of the mystical body of Jesus, and we are a very important stone of that foundation. So now, today we are living times that we were created to be prepared to live, because a lot of people live in fear, and they live in fear because they don't have faith. And uh, when we get together to reflect upon our faith, that means we get together to strengthen our faith. And uh, the world that we live uh, has never been any different than the world that began with exile when the first scene occurred and Adam and Eve were spelled out of paradise. It's the same world. And people think the world is different today than before, but it's always been the same. It's the same world we read in the gospel. So now, I have an experience with God. I have been a missionary, a Catholic missionary for 10 years, and I have been traveling the world for 10 years. And I have seen the church around the globe in the five continents. Uh, I travel constantly through the Catholic church, through seminaries and convents and monasteries and Catholic universities and schools and parishes and prayer groups and movements of the church, all kinds. At the end, here I am in St. Louis, Missouri, and I am in the same church, in the same language, regardless of race, nation, and who, whatever traditions and cultural backgrounds and, and uh, 
even educational levels and so many other things. Uh, I'm here in St. Louis, Missouri. Sometimes I'm in the Amazon jungle with natives that are, that are converted and they are Catholics now. And when I'm with them, um, if I look at the faith, the way we are to look at it, we are looking at souls. We are not looking at races, nations, cultures, traditions, none of that. We are dealing with souls. And that is the beginning of faith. If you're not able to come to shift into the level of the spirit and, and, and look beyond the flesh, you're not going to be able to have an experience of God that is actually a spiritual. Because experience of God is always spiritual because God is a spirit. But to be able to have an experience with God that will actually change you as much as leading you into being of the spirit is a different matter. And for that, you have to shift. You have to enter the spiritual world embracing it for real, which is to dare to be above your first nature, your lower nature, which is our humanness. And to be able to look at me and not to look a race, a culture, anything that, that divides me from you, that separates me from you. Because otherwise, you will never be able to reach me spiritually. If I look at you and I locate you humanly in a specific place, we will not have a spiritual language. We will have a human language that is not of the spirit. So if we are reflecting here upon the spirit and upon our faith, then we have to move on and shift into another level, to a spiritual level. Because we hear beautiful sermons and we, f we hear beautiful theology. You can, you can bring here doctors, you know, graduated in the most sophisticated theology. And they will be very articulate and very intelligent. And they will be sometimes emotional and make people cry of how beautiful they speak. But then for that to be a spiritual, it takes another move. Because people can hear sermons and beautiful theology for ages and that doesn't change them. Actually, you see hundreds of Catholics that go to all kinds of conferences and all kinds of gatherings. They walk out of there, they loved it, they heard beautiful things. Did they change? You see, very few people change with that. And that doesn't mean that, that, that good theology or good sermons are bad. On the contrary, we need them. But it's important to realize where do we have to go with all of this. We have to go deeper. And, and God wants more from us. God despises the mediocrity, despises the lukewarmness. God despises those that get stuck and don't move along, that they get, get satisfied with religion and become religious, but they never strive to be a spiritual. So when we go like this, we are, we are praying to the Lord that he will give us the grace to lead us into the spirit and to become a spiritual for real and to uh, to overcome just the state of religiousness. Because you see, religion alone is never going to take us to heaven. Good sermons and good theology won't take us to heaven. The only thing that will take us to heaven is a true transformation of the heart. And that begins by taking decisions, serious decisions. It's like today, <clears throat> we live a world that is menacing. You know, we. Uh, we have institutions, we have our, the institution of the family, which is so important in our lives and for the church. That's the, like the, the nest of the church, the family. And, and some, some of the families are threatened by the economy, by a lot of things that are really unpredictable today, more than ever. And that brings uh, a level of fear in many people, in, believer, in people that are believers. And sometimes they, their, their faith gets weak and they find themselves uh, filled with fears and anxieties. And you may ask yourself, if we, are, if we are such good Catholics and we are people that are always in church and doing so many good things, how come we are afraid? So there's something wrong with the faith when we are afraid. It is, it is human to be afraid because we will feel the fears because we have this flesh. And there's no way we could stop it. But one thing is to be afraid and another thing is to stay afraid. Because, like the apostle says, don't let the ire surprise you with the falling of the sunset, right? You have to come to peace with, in terms of peace with those that you are upset with before you go to bed. 
you have to be at peace before you go to bed, regardless of what happened today. The same thing happens with fear. You cannot go to bed filled with fears. It's okay if you, feel, if you are fearful today because of the news you heard or because of what happened to you, some events that are negative in your life. But before you go to bed, before the day is over, you have to be sure that you have to get ready of the fear. Otherwise, you keep on accumulating it, and one day, you, fear is going to be you. You're no longer going to be you. Fear is going to be you. So that's going to be the end. A lot of people become fear. And fear doesn't come from God. Anything, if you read the scriptures in any angle of the, uh, the scriptures, especially the, the New Testament, you will hear a word first than any other one. The archangel St. Gabriel appears to Our Lady, and she says, do not be afraid. And always, everything that comes from God says, do not be afraid, ever. So let fear come along, but do not marry it. Do not get engaged with it, you know? Then let it flow, let it pass by, because we can't avoid to have bad thoughts. You see, our mind is like an airport, because we are within the tree, within the tree of uh, good and evil. And we have a traffic that we cannot avoid until we get out of here. But as long as we are here in exile, we will have the sap of good and evil flowing through us. So sometimes we have these thoughts and these feelings and these passions and all of these ideas that, that are not good. But what do you do with them? Let them flow, because you also have the good flow. So always swim towards the good flow. Don't swim on the bad flow. But you can't avoid it. You, it's going to be in you as long as you have this flesh. So the spiritual exercises that we are called to embrace as Catholics are the exercises that will lead us to always swim on the right current, to swim on the side of the good sap, the, the, the sap of goodness that is God, that is faith, that is hope. And God will always provide us with the strength that we need to swim on the right current, even though it doesn't seem to be as simple as, as we expected, because the world is always leading us to go into the current of worrying, of being in, in fear, being in distress and anxieties. That's the current that is the most popular, because the world is building up into self. You know, if you read the philosophies and ideologies of this world of today especially, you will read that people are most inclined to go into self-realization. That's why so many Catholics turn Buddhist, right? And, uh, and also self-esteem and positive thinking is a flag that a lot of people are, are unfolding, right? And I tell you, if you are going to go into Christ-centeredness and you're going to review your faith <coughs> deeply, you're going to know how absurd it is to pretend to live up on self-esteem. Because I tell you one thing that the Lord revealed to me that is simple, but it's very important. Moses was talking to God. God was responding to him from the burning bush. God sent Moses to Egypt to get his people out. Moses asked God for his name. And the world today has forgotten God's name and is not living up to God's name. And why? Because God told Moses, tell them that I am sent you. And then the Lord told me, if I am, who are you? So if he is, I am not. <coughs> so for me to be, he has to be in me. Otherwise, I will not be. But what is the world teaching us? The world is teaching us that we are. And that's the devil telling Eve, you will be like God. And we still fall for that. We've been taught that, we've been told that, we still fall for that. Then we go for self-esteem. We don't have self-esteem. We have Christ's esteem. That's what we have. Our esteem is Christ. It's not self. It's not about self-love. It's not, it's not about building self. It's about building ourselves in God, the one that is. Because if we are not, how could we build ourselves on self-esteem? We are building ourselves on clay. So what we build on ourselves is going to crumble and crash. That's why when things get tough and rough, 
in, in, in our societies, like the economy and things like that, marriage that are in trouble, friendships and business and whatever that is. People are confused. Why? Because they build themselves on self. So they are losing control of themselves. You can never build yourself on something that is not. That's why the gospel teaches us to build ourselves on the rock. On the rock. And the rock is Christ. So we don't have self-esteem. We have Christ's esteem. And there is nothing, nothing, nothing you could ever achieve by positive thinking. Could you imagine something that you could achieve with positive thinking? Nothing. Because if we really read the scriptures right, reveal truth, what is God telling us? God is telling us nothing, absolutely nothing moves without outside his will. Nothing. Not even a leaf on a tree. Nothing. So therefore, you could sit here and think positively forever. If God doesn't want to, nothing is going to happen. So therefore, that is false too. And self-realization. Imagine this. Self-realization. You read about these atheist poets and all this literature about the philosophical, philosophical stone and so many other things. People are looking to, really, to, to find themselves and to have a self-realization. And you set up your goals just to have a self-realization. So you can achieve by yourself all the things that you, you set up to achieve, all your dreams. And this is something conflictive if you do not place God in the middle of this. Because if you are not, and God is who is, then what is it that you are going to realize about self? The only thing that we are to strive for and to search for is to find God, to know God more and better every day, not self. If I try to find self, what am I going to end up finding? Clay. You see, that's what I'm going to find at the end. I'm going to end up seeing that I am clay. But if I'm looking for God, I'm going to find the truth. So it's not about self-realization. So we have to understand the language of this world. Some, some atheist psychologists will be scandalized by what I'm preaching because they will say, well, this guy's mad, you know? But I tell you, it doesn't matter what they think. The truth is the truth, and we will not negotiate it. God is telling us, he is and I'm not. For him to be, for me to be, he has to be in me. And that's why St. Paul says, it's no longer I who lives, but Jesus who lives in me, Christ. St. John the Baptist says, I have to diminish so he, can, so he can grow. And it's all about our church is teaching us to die to self. It's a condition for perfection. Die to self. So the world that we live today is so materialistic and it's going to get worse. And you know that. That's not news that I'm bringing. It's something old. But we know. We don't have to be uh, prophets or magicians to know what's going on. But what do we do about that? If we are living a world like the one we live in today, we are demanded more by God because God gave us the goods in order to survive the times we were created to live. God doesn't make mistakes. If God created us to be alive today, we came with the goods. We came with the weapons. And we are going to be able to defend ourselves. <laughs> So when you feel sorry for yourself, you just being a sorry human being because God gave you. <laughs> God gave you the goods. <laughs> we came armed and we are dangerous <laughs> because we have the most amazing weapons. And, and the thing is, that's why we have to wake up and embrace the spiritual life for real and feel strong and joyful to have God on our side and to have the mighty army on our side. <clears throat> and that is what God wants us to do because we live a world that is dark and is so dark and it's going to get darker because we are at the very end of the very end of the end times. And it's not like I came here as a prophet of doom and gloom. I don't deal with that, with the, you know, end times messages, nothing like that. I mean, there's, it's true that there are many prophecies about what's going to take place at the end. It's okay, you know, that's fine. But we don't live up to that. Because we live up to today. The Lord says, 
every day with its rushes. I don't, I don't care how the world is going to end in two, three weeks or three, more, three months or a year. Who cares? We are all going to die anyways. Maybe all humanity at once. Maybe just me of a heart attack. Maybe I'm run over by trains, you know. Who knows? <laughs> but it doesn't make a difference how we're going to take off. We are all going to live. Uh, we take off from here, each one of us. So all these messages of end times don't necessarily help you to change your heart and prepare yourself to see God. They don't help you. But what helps you is to strengthen your soul. Because you see what is important? Let's say we all die right now here. And uh, we all, we will be all standing on, on the side of our dead bodies like this, right? We might not see each other. We might be standing on very different spiritual territories according to who we were. So, but one thing is for sure, you try to go back into that dead body and you cannot. You see, anybody that is still here alive in this, in this flesh will not be able to see you any longer or hear you, but you will be able to see everybody and hear everybody. So that is a very difficult moment. So what is the most important thing for you to do? The most important thing for you to do is to make sure that when you come out of this body, your soul is strong enough to make it out of the darkness, to go into the light. And when I say darkness, I say the world, the earth. If you read the book of Revelations, chapter 12, you read the whole chapter, there is a, uh, some uh, passages there about the battle between the angels. And then it says, this was revealed to St. John 2,000 years ago. And it says, it says, Satan and his f angels were thrown down to earth. It doesn't say that they were thrown down to a cave somewhere or to another planet. They were thrown down to earth. And it says, woe to earth and sea. Because Satan is really mad. His time is running out. And that's a long time ago. Imagine how mad he is today. I mean, it's getting closer, right? To the end. And so he knows that the time is up more and more. So he built up the most hyperactive world ever. He wants us to be busy 24 hours a day, and we still don't get it. And we're still rushing from left to right all day long, and we still don't know that he's stealing from us the graces. Because the most important thing of our life is to prepare to die. See, if you read the life of the saints, many of them were constantly, constantly doing a preparation to die. Life begins here. We were created on exile. If you read the Old Testament and read St. Paul about the Old Testament, he says, everything that happened to the people of God is a warning for us, for, for us to learn about what happened. And see this. The people of God that were born in Egypt were Jews, but they were Egyptians, right? Because they had been there for four centuries. So when, when God sent Moses to pick them up and take, take them out of Egypt, he sent them to take them out of their own country. Even though they had Jewish blood, they only knew Egypt. They were born there. It's like when you go and, and talk to a, uh, an Irish man in New York, right? You see them celebrating St. Patrick's Day. Most of them had never been to Ireland, right? And they had been here for a long time. <laughs> and they, if you, you call them Irish people, but they are Americans, right? And they, they live like Americans. They don't live like Irish people. And, and same thing happened to the Jews that were living in Egypt. They were Egyptians, but they had Jewish blood. And they had some, 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 some cultural Juda, Judaic customs, you know? Some of the religion was there. But you remember the stories. They were worshiping, you know, all kinds of objects and things in a second. You know, if Moses was taking a little longer to come down from the mountain, they were worshiping rocks and all kinds of things. They were Egyptians, pagans, you know, they, they had blood, uh, Jewish blood. But they were created on exile, but still they were the people of God. So where are we and who are we? We have been created to be the people of God, but we have been created in Egypt. Because the earth, the whole earth, spiritually speaking, is Egypt. And the Moses that came down from heaven, Jesus, came to take us out of exile. And he's leading us through the desert of conversion, which is the gospel. 
And we have to cross the desert. We have to go through the gospel and walk with Jesus step by step. You see that Moses that came from heaven to take us from the exile, from Egypt, he laid down, extended a ladder for us to get out of here, from earth to heaven. He extended it down, but it's the cross. And very few people want to climb up through the cross. Every time you hear about pain and suffering and tribulations and trials, everybody gets, gets off the cross, right? They step out and say, wait a minute. That wasn't supposed to be the case. I'm walking with God. How come this is getting so difficult, right? So this is what happened to the people of God in the desert. Every time Moses was taking long to come down from the mountain, they all went to worship rocks. So we're not any different today, right? Things are rough, things are difficult. We get off the cross and say, wait a minute. Let's find a solution here. This is not working, right? How come I pray so much and I do all of this? Where is God? See, testing God. We are not destroyed as the people of God that over 20,000 die one day just because they tested God. We are not burned like them because we have Jesus as a, as a priest sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us. And that's why the wrath of God will not annihilate us, even though we test him every day. But we are worse than the people of God in the desert of, 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 uh, when they, of the Exodus. And, and we still live the same human nature. Same. It hasn't changed. And we, we will not change until Jesus comes back. Every human being goes through Every one of us will go through the same. That's why the scriptures are today. Even though they speak about the Old Testament, the New Testament, but the word of God is not in human time. The word of God is in his eternal presence and present. So we are there with no time at all when we read the scriptures. Everything in the scriptures is related to us. You see, the scriptures are the story of one soul. Because in each one of us, we find an Adam and an Eve. We, found, we find a Cain and an Abel. We find an Abraham, and we find also a Jacob, and we find all the patriarchs and the prophets, and we find Judas Iscariot, and we find all these elements in each one of us. It's the story of one soul, the scriptures. When you read them, read them personally, and know that they are related to you. And they, they are talking to you directly. And that's, what is, that's why it's called the Word of God. So if we are to understand these mysteries like that, then we know that we have a responsibility uh, today. And it is, we were created as, God, as God's army, as soldiers. The Lord has revealed to me something very important to know. And it is, no one could ever become a Catholic on human will. No one decides that. Because we are Eucharistic soldiers, vessels of the Eucharist. You have to have been created one. Even a person that becomes a Catholic at age 60 was created to be a Catholic. Only in the mystery of the pedagogy of God, that person will embrace the fullness of the faith at that particular age. Example, Abraham. He was called by God, and he was over 70. He, was, he had been a pagan all his life. But you know something? He, he had been created to be Abraham. See? He was born to be the father of faith. He didn't become the father of faith because he decided to obey God. That's not the case. He was made, he was created to be that. Moses didn't decide to be Moses. Moses was created to be Moses. St. John the Baptist didn't decide to go to the desert and prepare himself. No, he was created to be St. John, John the Baptist. And each one of us have been created for a specific mission. And that's what we are. So how do you live up, on, up to uh, God's will? A lot of people ask themselves, I want to find out what God's will is in my life. And the answer is so simple, they don't want to hear it. Because the, you know what the answer is to live upon God, up to God's will? is to become a saint. So people say, well, is that it? See? 
<laughs> Same thing happens with people ask me, what can I do to help my family to convert? My children are away from God. So many relatives are falling away. What do I do? And when I give them the answer, they walk away really sad, like the rich man of the gospel, right? They walk away like this. The only way you can make a difference in your life and your family is if you strive unconditionally for holiness. It's the only way. What good does it do if you pray all day long for people and you're not changing yourself and you're not striving for holiness? Those prayers are not going to be strong enough to change anybody. So if you're striving for holiness yourself, your prayers are more powerful every day. Yes, and then your holiness is going to save them. That's why the Lord says, save yourself and your whole household will be saved. But when he says, save yourself, means become holy, very holy. The world is filled with demons. And you know how demons work? Demons are intellectual bodies. And they can only act through us, through our intellect, among us. Otherwise, they can only tempt us. You see, demons come and tempt us. When I saw, when I was speaking about the book of Revelations and the angels that came down, that were thrown down to earth, I was saying this. Okay, if they are here, St. Paul says, our struggle is not among blood and flesh, but it's with the principalities and powers of the dark that roam the air. So if you, if you come out of this body right now, you're going to see something that you didn't see while you were in the flesh. What are you going to see? The fallen spirits that are here. You are going to be in the full vision of them. So the first battle that you have when you die is to make it out of here. How do you make it out of here? If you have the true, if you have the true strength to say, away from me. Away from me in the name of the Lord. But if you have any business with them, are they going to let you go? No, that's why the gospel says, make sure that if you have something pending with your brother, go and make up with him before he takes you to the judge. And the judge sends you to the jailer, and the jailer will keep you there until you pay the last cent. And what is he referring to? To purgatory. So what is purgatory? You see, the beginning of purgatory will be coming out of this body and finding yourself in the lower world where we are but now with the full vision of the spiritual falling world. And now you can see them because you're no longer in a state of grace. A state of grace means that we are blind, deaf, and mute to the spiritual world. That is a state of grace. <coughs> Thanks God that you cannot see the falling spiritual world. I guarantee you that you will die of a heart attack instantaneously. I have seen it, and I see it many times, just because God chose so. Not because I'm anybody special. If anything, I am the least person to be here speaking about the Lord. I am, I have been the worst sinner ever. But the Lord chose me and sent me out to speak about Him because He wants to show that it's Him doing, doing it. And that's why He does that. Because it's like when you pick the uh, donkey from Palm Sunday, you see that donkey was convinced that the whole party of Jesus coming into Jerusalem was for Him. Right? <laughs> you know that. I mean, that donkey was like, whoa. Like, <laughs> he had no clue it was for the guy on top, right? <laughs> so that's why I always make sure, I always say that, Lord, remind me that the party is not for me, right? <laughs> I'm just the donkey. But, but that's something very important to, to understand, right? Because things can come up to our heads like that and become that donkey of Palm Sunday, right, in a second. You find a lot of those donkeys in the church, right? <laughs> a lot of people are so full of themselves. They are filled with great theologies and great speeches, and, and you know the thing is themselves, right? And they, and they hurt the faith, and they chase people away from the church. So here we are. We are facing, we are facing the music by having a true view of what is awaiting us. Do you know how long it's going to take us to be out of this body for good? Not too long. It's like I tell people, okay, look back right now. I don't know how old you are today, 
But look back and think about how long it took you to be the age that you are today. How long did it take you? It's a second. How long was it that you were a child? Like, it's not too long ago. I mean, it's like a dream. It's like a dream. How long do you think it's going to take you before you're out of this body, seeing a dead body that you cannot go back to? You're, going, you're trying, and it doesn't respond to you. It's going to be like this. It could be tonight. It could be today or tomorrow. It doesn't matter. But it's coming. So imagine what the devil does to us. He entertains us so that we forget about that. That's his main, you see, a skill. He wants to keep you very busy in this earthly life to catch you at the end of this life. Surprise, you can't make it out of the darkness because you don't have the strength. You were too busy with the flesh. You were too busy with the world. You were too busy with self. Very little busy with God and the spirit. And that's why he catches you. Hundreds of souls are trapped here. I see them very often. And nobody can help them. You know, we pray for them, we help them. But they need more than that. They want to talk to somebody. They can't, right? There's nothing they can do. There's no reverse. They can't get back. There's no way. And they're still trapped. Because it's going to be a long process before they go up. Because they didn't get the strength when they were supposed to get it. So here is what happens. We, we are in a gestation, a spiritual period. You know, a pregnant woman um, will pray to God for that baby to be born on the ninth month. Not on the eighth, not on the seventh, not on the eighth and three quarters, on the ninth month. Because she will, she will want that, that gestation period to be fulfilled. So that baby will be born healthy. I'm talking about a good mother, right? And she will be worried about what she eats, what she thinks, what she feels, what she wears. Everything she does is according to the protection of that baby. And eventually that baby will be born healthy. The chances are that that baby will be healthy because of the way the mother is treating that, that child. Our soul is not different. We are pregnant of a soul. That's what we are. We have a baby, and that baby is the soul. And we have to be even more careful with the soul. You know why? Because that particular gestation period of the soul, only God knows how long it is. So look at that. We have to be feeding that baby every day and making sure that baby is not going to come out prematurely out of your body. So what is the devil going to do? He's going to make sure that your soul comes out prematurely out of the body so he can trap you in the dark when you come out. Because you will not have the strength to come out into the light if you are prematurely in the spiritual world. Many souls are crippled. Many souls are paralyzed in the spiritual world when they come out of the body. Because they lost the gestation period God gave them. So how does Satan steal your time? By vice and sin. A lot of people kill themselves through eating, through uh, uh, alcohol and cigarettes and uh, sex and sins of the tongue that kill people really fast, you know. I've seen uh, one of the greatest killers of souls is the tongue, you know, and, and many other sins of the flesh, impurity, so many, and they kill your body. So what happened? Your soul comes out prematurely. If by the mercy of God your soul was saved, you will be in a terrifying darkness for a long, long, long time because your soul is crippled. It's, your soul is so undernourished spiritually that you don't have enough love of God in you because you, you lack of faithfulness to God. That is the only source of love in your soul that you are not able to cross the darkness. You hear about people that have near-death experiences. They talk about a dark tunnel, right? And you know what dark tunnel the dark tunnel is your flesh, your body, the world. You see, this world and your body are dark. And when you're coming out, they say they see the light there. That doesn't necessarily mean they will end up in heaven and they will have died. No, they see the light that is outside the dark. The darkness is your body and the lower world. So that's why they feel at high speed going out, because the soul is, doesn't have any time or space. So obviously, until it, since, since it is still connected to the body, it feels like it's going really fast into the light. 
So here we are in the dark right now. If you see the spiritual world like I had the opportunity to see it in the experience I had, when you come back, this sunshine that we have is like a dim light. It looks like a bad light bulb, you know? A very bad quality light, you know? Very weak. This is not the light. This is just the light we know. But the true light is beyond this. <clears throat> Nothing that you could ever dream is beyond your dreaming. True light is coming. This is just a reflection of it. That's why St. Paul says, we, we're looking at things now like in a mirror. We, we don't see things right. We kind of, we kind of. But then, one day, we will see it at the end of this life. So, bottom line, we can talk about God forever. We can hear the greatest theologies and the greatest preachers. But if we are not talking about what to do to be prepared to go into the light at the moment of dying, we are wasting our time. Because what is there more important to do than that? You see, we have to fill ourselves with the love of God in order to have a strong soul that will make it into the light. And the only way to do that is to become holy, to strive for holiness every day, all the time. Guard your tongue, guard your thoughts, guard your passions and feelings and instincts and senses and reason, guard them. Place a guard there to everything. Make sure you detect all your weaknesses and make sure you despise them. Consecrate them to the Lord and say, Lord, I despise this weakness. Please heal me. Let it go. Help me to overcome it. I want to be holy. I want to be yours. I want to be light in this darkness. I want to be hope in this world that has no hope. I want to be the focus of people to believe in God. So I need to be the soldier you created me to be. I need to be the vessel of the Eucharist I was created to be. And that should be the most, the, the most important aim of our daily life. Because you see, sometimes we act like the Romans and the Greeks in the Areopagus. You, you read in the Acts of the Apostles about the Greeks and all these people that went to the Areopagus in Greece. And, and even St. Paul went there to preach about the God that had no name. But what did they do there? They went there for pleasure, to hear these great magicians and poets and speakers. And they would come out of there as if they went there to have uh, some kind of entertainment, because that's what it was. It will not change them. It will not do anything to them. Unfortunately, today, we see, I sometimes preach in gatherings of 40,000 people, 15,000 people, 7,000 people, and I always wonder, what are these people doing here, you know? Are they re did they really come here to change their hearts, or did they come here for entertainment, right? Are they in the Are Areopagus, or did they come, you see, to Gethsemane? Did they come to bring themselves into the passion of Christ, to change their hearts, or did they come to the Areopagus? But I tell you, in the world we live today, most likely, most people go to the Areopagus. They go to entertain themselves, and they go, wow, what a sermon, what a speech, but did it change them? No, most of them walk out to have the second life, because you see, the sad part of our faith today, people have a double life. They are one in church, and in church they are so holy, they sweat in holy water there in church, right? <laughs> it's like, they are so holy. They kneel and pray, hundreds of rosaries and do even charity. They even give money to the poor and, and do things like that. But you see, they walk away from that and they go to live their little lives away from God, where you have all kinds of bad habits, all kinds of, of troubled hearts where you don't love, you don't forgive, you don't have compassion and charity with some people because they did it to you, because they hurt you, because they don't understand you, and then you don't love them and you don't forgive them and you don't want to deal with them. And some people you don't like their race, you don't like their culture, you don't like the way they speak or they dress or whatever. Sometimes you don't even like their nose, right? And, then, <laughs> and you just don't want to see them. But, and, and that's, that's what happens, double life, double life. And you know, we are called to have oneness with God, oneness. We are not to be divided. I can be a Catholic on Sunday or even daily mass on people and then be a second person somewhere else after I walk away from the church. 
Or I pray, you know, I kneel there and pray for a long time, and I stand up and go ahead and lie next door, right? So that's not what God wants from us. He's calling us to be one, one with God. That's why we have to remember, we have to embrace oneness with the Lord. And every day, we have to make sure that we are lining up, lining up with the Lord. Because it's like soldiers, when they are marching together, they, they, if, they see, if they see something they're not supposed to see, it's because they are outside the lines, right? Because they, what they're supposed to be seeing is the head of the soldier head, right? They are supposed to be online. You're supposed to see what? Who is in front of you. That's what you're doing when you're marching. So if you're seeing something else, you're not online. So that's what we have to do. Who is in front of us? It has to be Jesus, right? The main soldier is in front of me, and I'm following him. I'm not supposed to see anything else. If I see something else, I'm outside the lines. And that's why we have to focus on that march, on that line, on that military duty, that military sense of direction in life. We have to be true Catholics. We cannot be uh, in the middle. There is nothing in the middle, no such a thing as a gray zone. You either belong to God or belong to Satan. No way out. I would say, I don't know what everybody has been through, everybody here present, because, I mean, we could write uh, hundreds of books about our lives. And, and uh, I'm sure that God is doing amazing things through us, because whether we like it or not, every time we take communion, <coughs> things happen that we could never even imagine how big they are, because God uses us as reparation souls, and we are saving souls by taking communion. We are saving souls by going to adoration. We are saving souls by being who we are. As long as we are here alive, we are doing that. As long as we are with God, I'm talking about Catholics that are walking with God. Good, you know, some people are not very committed, but still they are instruments of God. And the question is, are we willing to really become the effective instruments God wants us to become? Because the times that we live in today, are very demanding. We have to become very strong because who is going to lead the way for the youth? Who is going to lead the way for the families and give hope to marriages, to matrimonies? Who is going to lead the way for the elderly that need consolation and need hope? Who is going to lead the way for the non-believers, people that have no clue, they don't know God, and where are they going to see God if we are not carrying Him? So we are demanded a lot because this world is dark and we are the light. We came here to the world to be the light of the world. And the devil is going to trick us because the devil is going to focus us on our little life. He's going to focus us only on our little family and our little worries. And it's true that we have to be responsible for what God has entrusted us with. But we have to go beyond that in the heart because we also have to think that everything we do in our little life has to transcend into the world, into every human being, because it has to be an example for everyone. And little things become gigantic in the body of Jesus. You see, little nuns like St. Teresa of the Little Flower, she never left the convent, and how large she is after she died. And from that little cell in the convent, she did everything, and many others. It's not about going to too many places. It's about going to the right place, which is the Lord in your heart, and then changing your heart. And from there, the Lord does wonders. From there, without moving, just from there. Because we are those instruments of God, so powerful that we don't need to move too much to do great things. See, the Lord showed me, in the beginning of my conversion, I didn't understand cloister nuns. You see, I said, what are they about? See you all. What are they doing there? I couldn't get it. Say, why don't they go out and help the poor or something, you know? They are locked up in there doing nothing, just eating, right? And sleeping. <laughs> it's like, and people are supporting them. That's not right. <laughs> so to me, it was very confusing. And, and then one day uh, during adoration, the Lord showed me what they were doing. And it says, the greatest contribution of a Catholic to the body of humanity, to the human family, is 
the presence of God in us in the Eucharist. You see, when a nun like that gives up the, her life and goes into a convent for the rest of her life, and she is a faithful nun, because today we have a lot of funny ones, right? But a faithful one. We have a lot of magicians today in the convents. But a true nun, right, will be there every minute of her life, every minute, will be saving souls. Every minute of the life of the nun. Because you know what? You know what a vow of poverty is, a true vow of poverty is giving up your blood. That's vow of poverty. Giving up your blood. So the Lord will buy with your blood souls all the time, as long as you carry the blood. So we have like a blood transfusion when we give up our blood. And you know how? The Catholic Church is the only one that could present an uncorrupted body. You know that no one has one. Nobody. Only the Eucharist can do that. So that's how powerful it is. The nun that is there and gave up her blood to God in a vow of poverty, then the Lord uses that blood to buy souls every day. Every day. While she's sweeping, while she's sleeping, while she's praying, while she's adoring the Blessed Sacrament, while she's going through the liturgy of the hours, whatever spirituality they have, the Lord is saving souls every minute because everything is paid with blood. So what is the blood that pays for the souls today? It is the blood of Jesus. And how does that blood continue traveling through time? Through us. You see, when we see the mystery of the Eucharist, we, we hear that is the passion of Christ all around again. And then uh, the scriptures say that Jesus only dies once. He died once. So you say, wait a minute. So if he dies only once, how come he keep on, keeps on dying on the, on the altar? So the answer is, he dies on us. When we come to Mass, he dies on us. He dies on our blood. And that's why we are living stones of the mystical body of Jesus. How does the faith will travel through time, through us? We are Catholics today because others gave the blood up for us to be Catholics. That's why. We're standing on the blood of the martyrs that became the blood of Christ because they became Christ-like. So depending on what we do with our blood, that's, that's the future of the church. How many Catholics will come into the faith to defend the souls on earth depending on what I do today? So I will diminish the mystical body of Jesus if I don't give up my, my blood, or I will augment it if I give it up. So it's about augmenting it. It's about enlarging it. It's about bringing more souls into the kingdom. It's about feeding the soldiers to come. That's our life. Our life is to give up our blood. Not only the nuns have to give up their blood. Even though we don't go to a bishop and say, uh, Bishop, I'm going to give up my blood. No, we don't have to do that. We can do it on our own, right? We can give, give our lives to God by being faithful. By being faithful Catholics. We will be on a vow of poverty. You notice that if you read the Old Testament, from the very beginning of Genesis, blood is at stake. Cain was talking with God, and God was talking about the blood of Abel. Say, the blood of your brother is claiming justice from the, from, the, from the womb of the earth. What did you do to him? And that's blood, always. And then you see blood going through the history, through sacred history. Blood, always. Everything paid with blood. Why? Because blood is life. So now, the only true blood is the blood of Jesus. It's the only one. So we need a transfusion. Because this blood we have is not going to take us to heaven. This blood we might make, make, may keep us here forever. We don't want to stay here. We are pilgrims. We have to get out of here. And the Lord came to tell us that. He said, yes, you were born here on exile. As the people of God were born in Egypt, on exile. But God wanted them out of there. Now let's get out of here. This is not your home. But for you to get out of here, you had to give me your blood. Give it up. Most people want to defend their little blood. It's about me. It's about my territory. They offended me. They've been rude to me. Oh, they hurt me. 
Oh, it's my blood, always. My territory. I'm terribly uh, confused because they attempted against me. It's like uh, they slander me. Oh, they are, you know, you know, uncharitable to me. It's my blood. I have to defend it. Oh, that is defending death. <coughs> you don't want to defend your blood. That's why the Lord says, crucify yourself with me. Lay down on the wood of the cross and die to self. Let them crucify you. Let them walk all over you. Let them slander and spit on you. Because you are to die to self. It's not about you. It's not about your blood. It's about Christ. So give up your blood. That is a true vow of poverty. If you are not able to give up your blood, you're not able to become Christ-like. How could you? So that is the real sense of direction we need to take if we are to become a spiritual. And I know that probably what I'm saying is not the most welcoming type of talk for a lot of people because they, they say, oh, he's so hard. You know, like God is good and he knows us. We are weak people. We are humans. It's like that's the most appealable, you know, type of excuse. When a priest is preaching from the pulpit saying, come on, don't be so hard on yourselves. God knows you. You are sinners. He came for you, for the sinner. He knows you. Oh, people will never change like that. That's the sermon of doom, right? Nobody will change because human beings like God, we, they give us a little excuse not to do something. We won't do it. The reason is, you see, Jesus never congratulated the apostles. Have you ever read a passage of the, of the New Testament? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. You see, have you ever read a passage in the New Testament where Jesus said, Come on, boys, let's party. You, you've been great. Oh, you've done so well. Congratulations. Never. Every, every corner they turn, Jesus will come around and say, Man of little faith, straighten up. You see, it's like every, everywhere, everywhere. He will even read their thoughts. You say, what were you talking about back there? Who's more important? Come over here. Let me tell you who's more important. And as, that's how Jesus was talking to them. And it's not because he was unjust. It's because he knew he had to get us out of here. How is he going get to us, get us out of here if he straighten us up? And we have to straighten up. We have to really become brave. And do you know who's brave? Not the proudful. It's very easy to be proud, proudful. To, to be in pride is very easy. To be humble is not easy, you see? To be brave is to forgive. To be brave is to have compassion and charity. That is to be brave. Who is the most important Christian ever? The one that forgives the most and the one that has the most charity. That is the most important one. The rest are wordless, <coughs> regardless of what they do. They can be all around doing great things for the church, left and right. If they have no charity, they are worthless. Everything they do is empty because that doesn't hit heaven. It doesn't work. It's just a human thing. It's just vanity, pretentiousness, and pride. That is worthless. So it's not about being popular and doing too many things. It's about being real. And being real is to be able to forgive and to be able to have charity with everyone. And you know, charity has to hurt, has to hurt. Sometimes I find prayer groups that are delving with deep mystical experiences. They follow in a mystic or something. And they know all the books of the mystic and they've been there for 15 years in that prayer group. So I come around and say, okay, let's do a spiritual exercise. You guys have been involved with this mystic for a long time. So I'm sure you have become very mystical. So now let's do an exercise. Go back home and open all your little closets and dare to give away everything you don't use. And you're going to see how mystical you have become. <laughs> <laughs> see, let's be real, right? Because we, we cannot fool ourselves. We cannot fool ourselves. I mean, if we are becoming spiritual, we are becoming smaller. Because being spiritual is becoming little. It's not becoming bigger, right? And becoming little is becoming little in all aspects, in everything. We have to diminish in every aspect of our lives. Otherwise, we're fooling ourselves, completely fooling ourselves. You are so spiritual. Okay, dare to forgive those that you don't like. Sometimes we watch TV and we are hating people we don't even know. <laughs> yes. 
It's true. Yes. It's like, that's how spiritual we are, right? It's like, and imagine if we despise in people we don't even know, how fast we despise people we know, when we know more about them. Yes. And those people we don't even know, we, we know very little about them, and we still despise them. Imagine the ones we have information of, oh, we will walk all over them, because we know more about them, right? So that's why we have to really go over of the things we're doing, and to become spiritual, you have to give up a lot of stuff. You have to begin to forgive. I had to forgive, and to forgive is to be able to look above this lower nature of ours. You have to dare to look at me as a soul. It's difficult to look at somebody as a soul, somebody that just slander you, somebody that just hurt you, somebody that is just not good to you. How could you look at that person as a soul? It's going to be difficult. But that is the way we are called to work. You see, God wants us to forgive people that we are not able to forgive, because otherwise, what is forgiveness? Forgiveness is to forgive someone we cannot forgive. Right? Otherwise, it wouldn't be forgiveness. Because if we want to forgive someone we love, it's very easy. Very easy. Someone we really love, when they hurt us, we are upset for a little bit. But then we forgive them, because we love them. But how could you forgive someone you don't love, to start with? Someone that hurt you, and you don't even know that person well. So you don't have any reason to forgive them, because you didn't even know them well to start with. So how do you, how do you like them? How do you, that happens sometimes with the parish priest. Sometimes we don't like the parish priest because we don't like his ways and we don't forgive him. We just don't like the way he celebrates mass, the way he acts, the way he deals with his own personal life and things like that. So we despise him and we don't forgive him. And we want, we want, we pray for a new priest all day long. We don't, <laughs> yes. We, we're not praying for a, for, for a convert, for the conversion of the priest. Oh, we're not praying for my heart to forgive the priest. We're praying for a new priest, right? <laughs> so imagine, that's the solution we give to everything. Some people are married and they're praying for a new husband, right? <laughs> and they end up doing that sometimes. So, so we have to really understand what spirituality is all about. In order to become a spiritual, we have to work very hard because we have to change a lot of things. But I tell you, God will be right there with us. I don't think there will be a better joy and a greater joy in heaven, especially your guardian angel, when you decide to be truly a spiritual. Your guardian angel will go, finally! <laughs> he got it! She got it! That, that will be the biggest party, right? Because it's the guardian angel is waiting for that moment all day long, right? And you, you are still walking in the wrong direction all the time. It's painful, very painful. And all you disease uh, relatives that are in purgatory, you know, they are only praying for you to get it, because that will help them too. So we're going to take a break and uh, about 30 minutes, and then we do the second reflection. Thank you.